Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special and exciting guest. He's actually, he is literally my favorite theater critic. He writes for The Spectator. His name is Lloyd Evans. Actually, you've got an even longer name than that, haven't you? You've got a well, proper Welsh name. Yeah, my, my full name is David Lloyd Evans. Uh, but there's a Welsh tradition whereby you um, uh, give the child three names and then choose the middle one. Uh, it's the same, actually, in Scotland. Um, Gordon Brown's name is John Gordon Brown. Little known oh, fact. I didn't know that. I and didn't it's very that. confusing for uh, when you're doing your bank details because it's very difficult to, <clears throat> uh, to convince the bank that uh, you have two different names. Uh, so it's a slight inconvenience. So that's another example of the oppression against the Welsh. That's right, yes. Of course, the Welsh, uh, the Welsh are you know, very much an oppressed nation. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the case that uh, one third of the world was once the possession of the English, uh, apart from England. Uh, England was once the possession of the Welsh. Uh, we, we got kicked out. Um, we got kicked out. Well, first of all, we, we allowed the Romans in for four centuries, and mm. we allowed them to build some roads and things, and some amphitheatres and some uh, <coughs> some nice palaces. Uh, and then um, after the Romans left, we got invaded by ABBA, basically. ABBA turned up from Scandinavia and Denmark, <laughs> and uh, and they, they booted us out. And that's, uh, that sort of rankles with us a bit. We, we got sort of banished to the, to the uh, Western... <coughs> Fringes. So you're saying that, that before the Romans arrived, there were the Welsh people in kind of Essex and things like that? Yeah, that's right. The Celtic, uh, you know, they, they're called the Celts, uh, but it's the same word. And the word, the word Welsh is actually an English word meaning foreigner. And the, uh, oh, the Welsh okay. call themselves Cymraeg. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, of course, the, the country that they inhabit is called uh, Cymru. And so this word is, is an invention of the English. The English came over here and called us foreigners. <laughs> uh, which is which is uh, somewhat uh, <coughs> so so Boudicca was Welsh. Well, Boudicca was a Celt, yes. Yeah, and, and so that that name was that name was Latinized into Boudicca. And so you Celts were, were kind of what dark and misshapen? Were you? What, 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 what do you look like? Um, yeah, probably like the, the the sort of stereotypical Welshman, you know, short and stout and uh, 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 squat uh, with dark hair. Uh, ideal for mining. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, my father was uh, six foot one with blonde hair and sandy eyes. Oh, right. So he wasn't a typical Welshman at all. Um, but you, I, I imagine you, you you sound posh Welsh. Because uh, I was raised in the home counties, but I mean, my dad was from uh, Llanelli, so uh, he had a pretty strong Welsh accent, the same town as Michael Howard. Uh, my mother was from Ireland, so I'm completely non-English. And you were talking, actually, uh, uh, making a fascinating point before we turned on the, the recording device, where you were telling me that you were... On, on a quest for reparations from the damages done to your forefathers by the Italians. Yeah, by the Italians, that's right. Well, I mean, um, taking a leaf out of the book of some Caribbean nations which are applying to uh, the British for reparations for slavery, I think yeah. we need to go in chronological order here. And yeah. uh, the Romans came here and enslaved uh, the uh, Welsh people, the Celts, uh, long before the um, British people went to the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, you know, my ancestors uh, were shipped over to Rome uh, as slaves and forced to build uh, certain Roman antiquities and uh, Italy today still benefits from those antiquities because over 60 million tourists visit Italy every year and high on their list of priorities is uh, a chance to look at these antiquities some of which were built by Welsh people and uh, some of those Welsh people would have been my ancestors therefore I would like to apply to the Italian government for reparations and I want a lot. Uh, I feel your pain Lloyd but I, I, I see a wrinkle in your plan have you had a look at the Italian economy recently? Yes, I know there is that. I mean, out of pity, I would not actually want to. Um, would want, wouldn't want to pursue it. Also, out of decency, uh, it's ridiculous to ask one government to fleece its own taxpayers in order to yeah. pay money to another government because this would be a, a, a government-to-government payment. No individual would end up receiving any money. Uh, <clears throat> and also, it's um, it's a ghost story. You know, pretending that my ancestors uh, suffered some wrong at the hands of somebody else's ancestors is is nonsense. It's not ju- it's not justice. And I, you know, I, I mean, the, the wider point really is the is people in the Caribbean who are being held in sort of uh, a state of uh, hopeful expectation of hundreds of billions of, of pounds, which will probably never come. Also, when you think about it, we are all descended from both the oppressed and oppressors. I mean, I, who's the English king from whom we're all? If, if, if you're British, basically, you're all 
uh, descended from Edward the Third, I think it is. Some, yes. Something like that. I mean, yeah. if you go far enough back, and in the same way, almost everyone has got Genghis Khan genes yes. in them, I think. Yes, I think they have. And, and the Queen is descended from the Prophet Muhammad uh, via some ancestor who was the... Um, the, the Duke of Cordoba or something. Yeah. So, yes, we're all, we're so, all interrelated. So, reparations are totally loose. By the way, I, I got very excited when you mentioned Rome because I've just, I've just come back from, from Rome and I'm full of the, full of the joys of the, the eternal city, as, yes. I, believe, as yeah. I believe it's known. Um, and, and, and what a fine place it is, despite the fact that it is going to hell in a handcart. I mean, it re- the, the, the municipal authorities are completely inadequate to the task of clearing up the the streets and mm-hmm. buses buses catch fire and explode and and the building the trevi fountain i went have you ever, have you ever yes i have it? i have the trevi fountain which i, th- I thought was going to be absolute kind of tourist tack completely shit and mm-hmm. lots of people in front of it so it, it is like it is a bit like the walking dead in places right but nevertheless the fountain itself is magnificent mm-hmm. I mean, it's really it, it's kitsch, but it's but it's beautiful. Yeah, 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 the yeah. water is clean. Do mm-hmm. you know why? Why? Private enterprise. Oh, really? Fendi, the Italian fashion company, mm-hmm. Fendi paid I don't know how many million euros mm-hmm. to get the whole thing cleaned up. Right. And uh, as a, as a quid pro quo, to use a sort of Roman phrase, mm-hmm. they got to stage a fashion show there, which I think would probably have been worth at least as much as they spent on cleaning up the fountain so it's a win-win situation just down the road if you go to the Pantheon mm-hmm. the Pantheon is still covered in, in Roman grime it's still all, all black why will it never be cleaned up? because it's in the hands of the, of the city authorities no it's in the hands of the church oh right of the Vatican right. which <coughs> makes sorry but this, uh, I'm about to end my, my mm-hmm. guided tour of Rome which makes 70 million dollars no actually more than that probably 90 million dollars a year from entrance to the Vatican Museums. Right. right. 25,000 people a day go through the Sistine Chapel mm-hmm. alone. Right. Can you imagine how much damage that does to the... Yeah, the, All I that bet. breath does yes, to the... Yes, <coughs> Michelangelo's. Yeah, did you did you go? Yeah, you did. I did. I booked the cheaty tour, mm-hmm. the smug tour, mm-hmm. I, where you, you get there at 7.20. Right. And they lead you... Th- it takes all that time to pass security and get to the Sistine Chapel. You're there at 8 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And so there are only about maybe 50 of you, as opposed to probably about two or 300, mm-hmm. if you go, go with the fish and chip mob. Right, right. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, yeah. I, I, should, I should mention to our dear, our dear special listening friend, uh, as, you, as you know, there's only one person who listens to this podcast, and they're very, very special indeed. Uh-huh. And I should explain how it is I knew you. You... You belong to a kind of a, a special golden generation within the golden generation of my time at Oxford. You were at Balliol. Do you know, do you know how, I, how I met you, Lord? Um, I think probably at a Chapsock. Um, it do. may have been at Chapsock, but I, but I have, a, I have a, a recollection. A bit like, have you ever read Le Grand Monde by Alain Fournier? Uh, I'm pretty Okay, okay. It, it's a class. Every Frenchman's read this work. It's a kind of, it's a sort of, it's a book about... Love and 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 yearning and and nostalgia for things that we can never recapture and so on. It's it's a magnificent work of literature. Anyway, um, the hero, Le, 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 Le Grand Moon, wanders one day and finds himself at this enchanted castle. It's, it's real, but it, and he meets this beautiful girl that that uh, anyway he, he ends up marrying. Um, in the same way, I wandered one night, pissed out of my brain, out of Christchurch, and found myself for some reasons. I think. Within the environs of of of, of Balliol, your your college, mm-hmm. and I sort of befriended or was befriended by a bunch of weirdos. I mean, you were a bunch of weirdos in uh, your year, uh, yeah. But maybe all we likable weirdos. Mm-hmm. You had there was you, there was Aidan Hartley, mm-hmm. the wildlife correspondent of of the Spectator, now uh-huh. far, now has a farm in Africa. Yes, yes. Um, there was R- Robert Twigger, Robert the explorer. Twigger, the explorer. Mm-hmm. Um, and author of many fantastic books. Yeah. Um, uh, Justin Rushbrook, the, ju- uh, the, the, the distinguished, lo- uh, the distinguished barrister. The QC <laughs> who recently won lots of money for Cliff Richard, yeah. the recording artist, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the star of Yesteryear. Who's <laughs> not known in America, but uh, no, no, very no. well known here. Yeah, very well no, uh, Who else was... I mean, quite uh, Jeff, Jeff Lee, uh, the uh, Jeff Lee, documentary the maker and um, novelist. An author who, uh, who is going to appear on the podcast. I mean, I, mean, I don't think there's any other college 
which would have produced quite so many contenders for podcast guests. Mm. And yet, it was it Balliol is a shit lefty college. Yes, yes. I, I mean, if you went there now, every, I imagine everyone at Balliol now probably. Uh, maybe there's one person listening to this podcast who disagrees with that, and I'm sorry, but almost everyone at Balliol sucks. I imagine they're, 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 they're going to be have got in on the basis that they 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 fit into the right deprived socio economic group and stuff, and and you know probably. Dozens of Etonians who would have been really good for to get into in, much cleverer, much mm-hmm. better educated, um, who would have been much, made a much better fist of three years at Oxford. But instead, they'll, they'll give it to a bunch of lefties who want to destroy the the, the whole city and, and replace Balliol probably with with red brick buildings and where, where you study Derrida and. Yes, and I th- I think there's a controversy about uh, Lord Curzon, who was the Viceroy of India. Uh, he was a, a Balliol man, and uh, I think one of his portraits has been uh, <coughs> put into a less conspicuous position. Yeah, yeah that mm. wouldn't surprise me. Oxford, yeah. we get, can we have a brief whinge about this? Oxford mm. is really shit now, isn't it? I, I'm, I haven't been back there for a long time. Uh, uh, take it from me, Lloydie, you would uh-huh. hate the place. Really? It is right. Absolutely. It has been, it has been, it's like Helmsdeep would be after the Orcs have taken over. The Orcs mm-hmm. are now running the whole show. Right. It's really <laughs> ghastly. You you wouldn't get kind of agreeable chaps like us there anymore. Really? We'd, 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 we'd have to go to Durham or to, uh, to, or to St Andrews or Bristol or perhaps somewhere like yes. that. Yes. <clears throat> I don't know how safe the other university... The only university I know which is definitely safe mm. is Durham. Mm-hmm. I go there all the time. Well, I say all the time. I mean, mm. probably two or three times a year. And they are very sound. And it's got that collegiate atmosphere and it's a civilised place. And I think probably when you do the courses you're not just doing kind of postmodernism and marxism studies you're actually doing something maybe worthwhile don't know about bristol mm. yet don't know about mm. st andrews I'm, I'm i'm planning a kind of tour right of these places uh-huh the hate tour the hate no the love tour <laughs> the love no, I'm tour talking, i'm talking about the uh, the kind of sentiments that, uh, that that you will be greeted with the weird thing is lloydie that i can call you lloydie yes yeah. I, I like it i like people who call me lloydie yeah, yeah. only three people in my life have called me lloydie really my mum uh, a girl called cynthia hamilton and you <laughs> oh that's really sweet <laughs> and uh, is cynthia hamilton nice yeah she's lovely yes. oh great, great she sounds nice um yeah i have this weird experience particularly as a result of the podcast which is that i get accosted in the streets now mm-hmm. by by <coughs> mega fans sorry the only listener the special friend listeners yeah who takes many forms mm-hmm. the special listening friend accosts me in the street right and when I was just one more Rome anecdote mm. when I was wandering through um, have you, you you've been there I have yes okay so there's this this hill of ruins isn't there the, mm-hmm. is it the Aventine or the Palantine, Palatine I forget maybe it's maybe they're both called uh, yeah I, I was only there briefly okay. uh, some time ago by the Colosseum anyway the, mm-hmm. I think it's the Palatine Hill and you go and wander amid these ruins, and you you really haven't a clue what they are. Mm-hmm. You just just you know pillars and, and rubble and stuff, and you, you 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 kind of guess what might have happened there pretty badly. And what you end up doing is is latching. You you hit. You see a tour guide, and you sort of latch onto his tour, and you, and you think, is he going to is he going to notice that I'm not on his tour? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so we were hovering a bit, and then you sort of. Y- y- you you realise after a, a time that this is a bit indecent uh, mm-hmm. of, of leeching off somebody else's tour, so you, so you wander on. Anyway, a bit later on that afternoon, I got this this DM on 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 my Twitter, and this chap said, "I spotted you in the forum earlier today. I'm your biggest fan. Please, please, let's meet up later, and I will give you a free tour of Rome." Really? Wow! Yeah. Wow! So this is the and he, and he was you, great by you're, the way. You're, you're being stalked by I, tour guides wherever I, you go. And and he said he said, "Do you get recognised often?" And I said, "Well, I tell you what freaks me about being recognised by fans like you, Anton, is that there must be lots and lots of enemies out there mm. who spot me as well and clock me." And I said, "So far, they haven't attacked, but." You just don't know. But anyway, it is very, very gratifying when m- m- my special friends accost me in the street and mm-hmm. offer me free tours of Rome. Yes, say. yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm intrigued by your uh, tour of, of uh, universities. You, you've come up against some hostility at universities. And um, I just have, I have a measure of sympathy with students today. And they're different from uh, the students that we were because they're paying for it. Uh, and we weren't. We were very privileged to join a marvellous institution and we felt that we were taking part in this this um, great historic quest to find the truth and to uh, take part in this contest of ideas. Um, but today's students 
um, I think they have some right to want to claim a safe space. They want to get away from the hell that is Twitter and the internet. And so I have a measure of sympathy with them uh, for wanting that. Do you think that the fact that we had a, a free education made us um, more appreciative of the idea of university as a kind of a formative intellectual experience as opposed to a kind of a, a, a way to get the credentials to get a job. Do you think it, do you think we appreciated university more and used it better? Um, I think we might have used it worse actually. Uh, really? I mean I, I was uh, <clears throat> because it was free I felt I could study anything so I studied classics which is not um, a particularly marketable it doesn't give you a mar any marketable skills except to become oh, no, a classics a master. Come on Greats. Everyone wants to do great. Yeah, I know. That's right. It was great. It was. It was. It was literally. It was great. And were you good? Uh, I wasn't that good. No, no. I didn't. Uh, I, I. I was. I was sort of. You were sort of encouraged to do other things while you were there. Uh, I mean, I remember having a having a, a formal chat at the at the end of each term. You had a formal chat with the master of college. It was called handshaking. And oh, yeah. if if the if the encounter ended with a handshake, that meant you were being sent down or expelled. So it's one of these quirky um, Oxford, oh, Oxford uh, conventions whereby the thing is called, is given the name, which is the, which is the thing it isn't. Um, and I told him that I was um, involved in making a film and he suddenly lit up. He was absolutely enthusiastic. He was really, um, he said, what's it about? Where are you filming it? Who's in it? You know, who wrote it? Did and, it involve donkeys? Uh, it didn't involve donkeys, <laughs> okay, no. Right. And um, he, was, he, was, um, he was much more interested in that than hearing my philosophy lecturer give, give a, um, an account of my inability to write... Um, essays about ontology. Yeah, we were encouraged to um, t to regard it as a sort of um, marvellous place where we could um, pursue intellectual dreams like a Yeah, but like hello, a, a sabbatical. Is, is, is that not the point? It is the point, it is, it is the point, yes. Very much the point. I think not, the, the point is not trying to undermine the fabric and traditions of the university in the form of kind of vacuous protests like roads must fall or whatever, yeah. or, or this this <coughs> new obsession that they have on, on the arts degrees of decolonizing the curriculum yeah. so replacing uh, dead white males mm. that you've heard of and have a body of literature that's been recognized over time with probably people from an ethnic background probably women as well mm -hmm. uh, who've done absolutely sod all but have been been put on the list because hey they've been allegedly neglected yes yes which is a bit sad uh, it is a bit sad if that's if that's happening and uh, I, I suspect I suspect it is happening um, I mean I saw a, a, an interesting play um, a year, just over a year ago, at the Edinburgh Festival, yeah. uh, about this roads must fall business in South Africa, and the students, um, the students who were uh, attempting to destroy this statue, which is just a piece of metal, really, yeah. uh, they spent hundreds of hours, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of man hours, uh, in, uh, organising the protests and uh, lobbying to have this thing removed. Uh, not one single second of that time was really spent redistributing wealth or opportunity. Uh, among their community, which is the ultimate object of it. And that, so if, the, if the, the, the oppressive powers, if the white supremacists have wanted to devise a scheme to neutralise di dissent, the, the statue and the pr protest against the statue would have been a perfect scheme because so much time was wasted on it. And it was a very astute play because as soon as the statue was, was destroyed, the students turned on each other and they started accusing each other of being sexist and of being um, homophobic and things like that. And so they were just—they were just an, ang an angry bunch. It sounds quite a sort of um, a radical play. Yeah, but it, it wasn't. All the—all these these um, uh, conclusions I'm drawing were unintended. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> it was trying to say yes, this is absolutely right that we should be knocking down this this uh, sta this symbol, you know, which right. is in the end just a symbol. Right. Um, well, I, I want to talk about plays in the next section actually. So we're going to have a break here. You're listening to the Dallingpole podcast with me, James Dallingpole, and my very special guest. Lloyd Evans, theatre critic, uh, Balliol graduate, and um, Welshman. Playwright. Playwright. Oh, yeah, playwright. Yeah. Okay. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place? I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre. Bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily. Weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Lloyd Evans. Lloyd, 
you before we go on to your marvelous career as a as a theatre critic, you wanted to pull me up on 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 a mistake I'd made. You and I both appeared a few years back in a a legendary TV yes. documentary. I think it was legendary. Yes, called was. When Boris Met Dave. Yes. Now, just just tell tell the special listening friend why we were in this documentary. Well, it was um, it was quite a daring documentary. It was broadcast on the eve of the general election, uh, which David Cameron was expected to win, and it's it's very um, audacious of a broadcaster like Channel Four to um, make a hostile documentary about an incoming prime minister. I mean, that's quite reckless. And they were very uh, concerned that everything that we said about him was authentic. And so they had to find people who actually were at Oxford with these two guys, with David Cameron and his great opponent, Boris Johnson. As it happened, I was at the same, uh, same college studying the same subject as Boris Johnson. And um, my collaborator, my chief collaborator, Toby Young, was at the same college as David Cameron studying the same subject as him. And I wasn't in either of those colleges, but I knew both of them. Yes, you did. Uh, and I, I concealed from the broadcasters the fact that not only had I never met David Cameron in my life, I hadn't even heard of him at Oxford. <laughs> really? Yeah, that yeah. Is, that, I'd never heard of him. That no. is quite funny. But, mm. but, but he wasn't at Balliol. So. He wasn't at Balliol, no. And he was a couple of years below me. And also there are 12,000 people there. And you know, did you, Were you in the same... Did you ever share tutorials with Boris? He was a year below me. Oh, right. So, so, so you looked down on him. Uh, and, I looked down uh, on him, I mean, yes. did, did, did you know him at all? At, uh, at, I knew at, him a bit because he was living right next door to Justin Rushbrook, who Justin Rushbrook uh, spotted Boris's potential and they became allies and friends and still are. Right. I mean, I like Boris very much, but he's quite opaque. I mean, he's quite, he's quite bluff. There's yes. a sort of carapace, a very thick carapace that you don't really know what the sort of person like is like underneath. Yes, he's fair? he's performing all the time. Yeah, uh, uh, performing, and he what he likes doing is getting into trouble, uh, and then he likes watching himself get out of trouble. And um, it's interesting. I, I, I've seen him do this at um, he, uh, a book launch uh, that he uh, uh, he had a book out about ten years ago called um, Friends Vote Friends Voters Countrymen. In his speech um, about the book to the publishers. Um, he kept on using this phrase, um, mega biblion, mega cacon, uh, which is Greek for uh, a big book is um, a big evil, or uh, to be, to be uh, <coughs> more accurate, a big book is a big load of cack. So making an excuse for writing a short yes, book. Yes, exactly, yeah. yes. And um, he was sort of teasing them a bit, but teasing them in ancient Greek uh, <laughs> right. and, and sort of enjoy, just enjoying himself. He was doing it purely for his own amusement. Um, and I think that's that's a, a side to him. He, he sees life as just a big game, a big adventure playground for him. So you mean, were he prime minister, mm. he he might start a, a war on a whim in order to see how it sort of how he can get out of it. He might he might even go that far. Yes, yes, he might. You know, I think he seems to have, he, he seems to have um, detached himself from his ambitions in the last few months. But uh, you never know. Well, I th- I. I, I I'd be very happy with him as Prime Minister. Yeah, so would I. I think he'd, be, he'd, he'd enjoy it. I like Prime Ministers who enjoy being Prime Minister. That's why I hated John Major. John Major found it all a terrible you know, nuisance. And sometimes Mrs Thatcher gave that impression as well. She gave the impression that she was this embattled figure surrounded by these hopeless civil servants and unionists who were trying to destroy her. Uh, that's why I like Tony Blair. Blair liked power, and power suited him. And, of course, until the disaster of the, of the Iraq war, um, he gave the impression of somebody who was, who was really enjoying it, you know, and that, that's good, that's heartening. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, me, yeah, he enjoyed it. Meanwhile, he was screwing up the country for, for generations and, in a way, setting the seeds for, for, for Corbyn. Well, he was privatising the NHS, which is um, something you shouldn't really uh, uh, do. Um, and um, people now believe that this, this programme of privatisation was initiated by the Conservative Party, but actually the Conservatives have been very good at preserving the NHS. He certainly set up these financial arrangements, these PFI contracts, which were a, a terrible imposition on the taxpayer, let's yes. say, and on future generations. Yes, they, they were very long-term contracts as well. They were 20 or 30-year contracts, which are still, still in place and are still rewarding shareholders. It's extraordinary. I... I I, I, I'm a great believer in in, in, in free markets and and in in shares and and stuff. But it's when when the government finds itself in negotiations with hard-headed businesses, mm. it's always the hard-headed businesses which 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 get the better of the deal. Yeah. And the taxpayer is sharp. Because yes. Politicians are not very good at that kind no, of stuff, not, are no, they? Hopeless, Nor no. civil servants, it, it, it seems to me. No, and they're particularly bad at, uh, at, at computer technology. You know, every time there's a, <coughs> a new a department uh, commissions some new tech, it costs billions and doesn't work. You know. 
you know, we hadn't even got onto the anecdote that, that oh, I no, mentioned no, at the haven't. beginning <laughs> about how when I went, when I came up to Oxford in my first term, I think, there, there was a... There was the, the main university magazine, wasn't there? Was Charwell. Mm. And then there was a satirical ISIS. magazine. Uh, oh, sorry, ISIS. With the, yes. Unfortunately named ISIS. ISIS. Yes, na- named after another tributary of the Thames. And then there was, then there was the one that you worked on mm. called, called Trib, tributary. tributary. Which was yeah. much more sort of gossipy. Yes, and gossipy. And um, yeah, we, um, it was, what, so one thing we hadn't realised, it's very difficult to write gossip about people when nobody has a job, nobody has any official responsibilities, nobody is married, nobody has any children, nobody can really commit any transgressions. So we were rather, we were sort of always looking for something to write about. And so we decided that we would have a, um, a category called Pushy Fresher. And we decided that James Zellingpole, with his sort of friendly, outgoing, effusive manner, was ideal to be the pushy fresher. I was so pleased when I got it, when I made it. And uh, I wrote this this line, um, James Zellingpole comes up to me at a party with a glass of wine in one hand and a glass of wine in the other, which James um, has all his life believed was written by Toby Young, whereas in fact it was written by me. And I'd like to claim the credit for it now. Yeah, well, the credit is all yours, Lloyd, and, and history will note mm. that... That, that future scholarship will be great. Future scholarship, exactly, because you don't want Toby Young being credited for any more no, than, than he already is. Yes, no, yes, exactly. <laughs> we, how, how, how friendly with you were, were you with Tobes, by the way? Uh, I was reasonably friendly with him, not as much as he was very friendly with Aidan Hartley. He really looked up to Aidan Hartley as as kind of Tarzan. Um, he thought he was a superhuman figure. Well, Aidan is eight of all of us. No, well, actually, two of the Twigger and Hartley are both proper men. They do yeah. manly things. I mean, they, they would not be out of place in King Solomon's mind. No, no, that's right. In the right. Stuart Granger. Younger listeners, that's, a, that's, that's an actor from a very long time ago. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, Toby was, was, was on the podcast about three or four podcasts ago. Yeah. Um, I think it's a mistake for Toby to try and suck up or become to or become part of the establishment. Do you not think? Um, I, well, I think he's rather blown it now uh, over this. Well, he this has. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that he should never have tried. You, 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 you cannot. If you're a, if you're a journalist, you are an outsider. You're an outcast, aren't you? Mm. you you're, you're you're outside the tent, pissing in. Yes. Yes. And mm-hmm. what you, you can't really go into that urine-filled tent and expect to to thrive. No, I suppose not. I, I mean, I think he got um, he really got the bug with this um, the free school uh, endeavour that he, he got involved great. in, oh, which is great. And so he set up this uh, amazing network of, of free schools, which were all doing extremely well. And then he got appointed to um, to some uh, government quango, quango. non government quango. And then it surfaced that he'd said that somebody had Baywatch tits. <laughs> And, um, that's a fantastic phrase. I know. Uh, I think that was about his wife, talking about his wife, you know. And uh, surely that's a matter between him and his wife, isn't it? You'd have, you'd have thought. <laughs> you'd have thought. Yeah. No, it, I think he, w- he, was, he was found guilty of the crime of writing entertaining copy yeah. in his career as a journalist. Mm. I mean, we're yes. all guilty, aren't we, if, that's, well, yes. if that's the, the, the bar is that low? Well, for most of that career, he specialised in making enemies. Uh, and he called his autobiography how to lose friends and alienate people because that was his that was his shtick that was his persona I, i'm the i'm the guy you want to hate i had a i had a long period where i i wouldn't speak to toby I, for about five years i would not speak to him because he does he is the scorpion on the on the back of the frog he mm. does he does sting you well he, he used to anyway it was his shtick yes yeah but you landed the job of, of Spectator critic, uh, so, uh, theatre critic on the Spectator, which you've been doing for how long? Quite a, quite a while. Um, quite a while, yeah, about fifteen years actually. Yes. Yeah, and you are really good. I, I mean, if you if you dis a play, dis, dis a production, I tend mm. to think it's not worth going to see. And if you mm-hmm. rave about something, I I want to go. But a lot of a lot of. I could never be a theatre critic because hmm. so much of the stuff you see is absolute dross, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'd, if I go, I see about 100 plays a year and if I see four good ones, that's quite a lot. That's a high yeah. ratio. Um, a lot of plays are all right and that's very annoying. It's difficult to write about something that's all right. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to kind of go in um, strong, either one way or the other. Yeah. I don't like writing blandly about something. Um, but it's, yeah, if I see, if I see a, a, a decent play every three or four months, that's, that's not a bad ratio. So, for those who are visiting London or, or go to the theatre a lot, what are the what are the your four must sees of the last three or four months? Or um, six there's months? a very good play on Hampstead at the moment called I and You, uh, which is a teenage romance with a fantastic twist. I won't give it away, okay. but it's the best uh, 
finale to a play I've ever seen. And it's a very, very funny play about a couple of um, a couple of slightly ditzy um, teenagers having a romance in a in their bedroom. Uh, it's okay. called I and You, and it's really good. So that's going to transfer to the West End, probably. I, one would hope so. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I mean, it does help if you have stars in it. Actually, sorry, I forgot the the, the woman in it is a star. She's in Game of Thrones, I think. I, oh, I never she? Watch, yes, I never watch TV, so I don't. I, I what, only watch news. Do you know night. what character she plays in Game of Thrones? No, or? I don't. Okay, well, we, we can people can look it up on the on the internet, can't they? Um, there's a very very funny camp play called um, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, which opened a year ago. And it's still running and is now booking for another six months or 12 months. And it originated in Sheffield. And it was actually, it's actually based on a TV documentary about a boy who wanted to wear a frock to his school prom. Um, and um, some of those terms are a bit unfamiliar. Uh, even as I'm saying them, I'm thinking, what am I talking about? School prom. We didn't have school proms when I was a We've adopted a kid. loads of American stuff yeah, yeah, since, since, since we were young. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. This whole Halloween is just crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so that's good. Everybody talk. Everybody, everybody's talking about Jamie is great, and I and You is great, and uh, of course, School of Rock is the best musical I've ever seen. And I, I love. Um, I, I'm a great fan of Andrew Lloyd Webber, especially the early ones, Jesus Christ Superstar, and and Joseph. I loved, and School of Rock is fantastic. And the the book was written by Julian Fellows. Now you wouldn't have thought it, but Julian Fellows went to see the Beatles and the Rolling Stones live in the early '60s. Julian Fellows. That is extraordinary. <laughs> the, apparently, the Beatles live were just pretty awful unless you caught them in the very early days in sort of Hamburg or wherever because all you could hear were girls screaming yes I think a lot of these people did see them in the early days and they were playing in places like Ricelip and Janet Street Porter who's a, a celebrated broadcaster in this country saw the Rolling Stones and the Beatles on consecutive evenings in 1962 she did you know she did that, yes that is I, I don't think you could really beat that I know it's amazing in, in rock and roll mm. terms yeah um, so um, I'm disappointed and uh, I wonder whether I live not too far from the Royal Shakespeare Company mm -hmm. in, in Stratford and I have seen some brilliant productions there the, the Richard the third with sorry Richard the second with Doctor Who with David Tennant yeah he's very good yeah he's great I blew like me away mm -hmm. it's, I just, it's almost my favorite Shakespeare play mm -hmm. and, it's, and this was a, an immaculate production yeah but so many of the productions at the RSC you sense that the need, their need rather, for diversity casting, mm -hmm. has trumped the uh, the need for artistic excellence. Yes. They seem to have forgotten that their purpose as the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company is to show Shakespeare at his best, mm -hmm. and instead it's kind of Buggins' turn for sort of to rectify social social inequalities. Which uh, yes, I know, and and the, unfortunately, the people who have to pay the price for that are the are the audience, and particularly the first time audience. If you go and see a Shakespeare play and you're not familiar with it, and it's often very tangled, very complicated uh, family relationships, and if you have cross dressing or tr transgender casting or wrong gender casting, it's extremely confusing. I went to see um, Gandalf uh, in McKellen yeah. in King Lear uh, about six months ago, and um, King Lear, the opening uh, opening scene of King Lear is extraordinarily uh, efficient dramatically because the power play uh, is being conducted on a family level and on a state level. So the family is effectively the cabinet and King Lear is abdicating and handing out the departments of state to his own members of his own family. But it's crucial that you understand the family relationships. Um, and he has two daughters and then his third daughter was played by a black woman who clearly obviously wasn't his natural daughter so a first time we would imagine that she was an adopted daughter yes and that that was the cause of the beef between between her between Cordelia and the other two sisters meanwhile Kent a hugely important figure in the play was played by a woman and it was natural to assume even having seen the play ten times I thought hang on has King Lear got a wife suddenly she was playing the counsellor to, to Lear and she seemed like either his sister or his wife and a first time we would assume that it was she was the wife or the sister yeah. or a cousin or something and it was really confusing and it's so unfair on, on the, the new arrivals the people who haven't seen Shakespeare before to see it done badly like that it's unfair on Shakespeare it's mm. unfair on punters who are paying they're not cheap tickets for the RSC no I bet they, they aren't I no. mean, yes, he says a man who never <laughs> paid for a theatre <laughs> ticket in his life I think for decent seats you're probably paying 30 quid yeah. 35 quid per and you do want to be in the decent seat. Mm -hmm. and that's it. I've, I've sat in the upstairs bit, and it's pretty. Well, miserable. I mean, that's half what you pay in the West End, or less than half, actually. Really? Well, I went to I went to see Aladdin, uh, and they were great. Uh, that, Aladdin's very good, by the way. I went uh, with my son, and I looked at the cost of the seats. They were 132 pounds each. 
to see Aladdin. I mean, that's a family holiday, isn't it? I really <coughs> hate to say this, um, but I do want to go and see Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. I, I haven't... Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I've... I've it's I've, good. I've, I've been hearing the tunes. Yeah. Uh, my daughter has been listening to them and says, right. Dad, we've got to go and see yes, this. Yes, it's hypnotic. It's hypnotic. Once once you've seen it, you, uh, I'm, I'm starting to think it now. I'm Alexander starting to move Hamilton. up and down. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's, it's very good. quite yes. well, doesn't it? It's, it's also it's, really interesting constitutionally and historically. I mean, it's not the kind of subject matter you'd think for a musical. Um, it, it's covering ground uh, such as um, how America allowed itself to declare war on other nations uh, and the precise constitutional arrangements that were made to enable that to happen. I mean, it's very abstruse sort of stuff. You know, it's Vernon Bogdanov sort of stuff. Yes, uh, quite. So, well, you can fashion musicals out of the most extraordinary things, can't you? Yeah, you can, yes. Like chess, for example. Uh-huh. <laughs> I went to see that the other day because my, 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 you know, my special friend, Tim, Tim Rice... Oh right! I, I go and see his his shows. Oh, do you? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Right. Right. <laughs> he's he's my number one famous fan. Oh, is he? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, do you think? Please God, please say yes. That there was going to be a backlash to all this this diversity, this gender gender neutral casting nonsense. Because aren't aren't the audiences getting a bit pissed off with this stuff? Uh, I'm not sure that they are actually. Um, I think they 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 might be going along with it. Um, and I think one of the difficulties is that um, uh, an artistic director of a, of a theatre needs to have um, a co- needs to have a reason to put a play on, and it's very easy for a director to say, right, we're going to do it in this particular way. If a director comes along and says, well, we're going to do it in tights and tunics and uh, everyone playing the the uh, the correct uh, gender and it's going to be set in the correct historical era, that sounds rather. Uh, bland, and of course the artistic director wants to impress other artistic directors with his daring and his sense of adventure and novelty. It's a bit like public school headmasters. That there are almost no, or private schools as Americans might call them, um, no no sound public school headmasters anymore because they're all eager to show how forward-looking they are and how how against all the all the the hidebound traditions that have held hitherto held schools like. Eton and rugby and Harrow back, and they want to show that they're they're taking their their boys and girls into the future. And in the same way, I suppose it's impossible. You probably can't get the gig in the first place, can you, as an artistic director, unless you pay lip service to all these these right-on shibboleths. Yes, I, I expect so. But of course, there's also there's always a little bit of corruption going in uh, 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 at the same time. I mean, you're talking about the RSC, which is run by uh, Gregory Doran. Uh, who's very keen on on, on diversity and, and casting uh, in order to, uh, as it were, to uh, spread the net as wide as possible. But of course, his husband is uh, Sir Anthony Cher, and he yeah. always gets the best parts. And there's um, a woman has just taken over uh, control of the Globe, Michelle Terry, and her first production was Hamlet, starring herself as Hamlet. Um, her next production is Macbeth, starring herself as Lady Macbeth, and her husband Paul Reedy as Macbeth. So. She's actually, um, she's actually practicing nepotism. Yes, I don't mind. I don't mind uh, Gregory Doran promoting his husband when he is Anthony Sher, because Anthony Sher is, is not a bad actor. Yeah, he's a good actor. Yes. What does bother me? Another thing about about RSC productions. I, I, I'm, a, I'm only focusing on the RSC because I live near there, but I'm sure that other national companies are equally rubbish, and equally PC, like the National and stuff. Um, is there's always a, ga- a, a gulf between those of the actors who can speak a diverse, mm-hmm. who can speak an iambic pentameter and make sense of them, mm-hmm. and those who just might as well have wandered in from a second-rate school production. Yeah, there is always that problem, yes. I mean, I, I found that uh, difficulty with uh, when uh, Lenny Henry played Othello in the West End. I must have been the only person who... who I, I was under the apprehension that he didn't really understand what the language meant. You know, I, it was a dreadful performance. It was so bad, it reminded me what bad acting is. You don't often see bad acting, but one symptom of bad acting is that the uh, a bad actor can't remain silent, uh, can't remain still. Stillness is a, is a quality prized by directors. The ability, when other people are acting, to do nothing convincingly and he couldn't do it what was, it, what was he doing he was, he was moving his eyes around all over the place look, trying to mug trying to get a laugh trying to get trying to get attention just really bad um, hyperactivity yes and of course he won he won an award for his brilliant uh, Othello I thought it was it was dreadful and his Iago was dreadful too yes oh, oh sorry well, Lenny Henry was, was Othello uh, yeah. Lenny Henry was Othello R- yes. rather than modishly Iago because that would yeah. have been quite interesting casting but uh 
Yeah, one of the, one of the, the main characteristics about Othello mm-hmm. is the beauty of his language. Mm. That's that's what wins over um, Desdemona. Yes, yes. I I saw Othello's visage in his mind, something like that. She says. So he's meant to be really uh, yes, good at the verse yes. speaking. And it, and if he can't speak the verse, then I'm sorry. He may be the right colour. Mm. He may be famous as a comedian who was on Tis Was. Yeah. Once. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> but I imagine that most of the audience were just going, tongues hanging out, it's Lenny Henry off the TV, and he's B-A-M-E, whatever the, the modish phrase is. Yes, no doubt that was it. And, uh, you know, he was trying to, he was sort of trying to get some laughs in there, I think, at some point. Uh, but it was... It yeah, was, uh, because Othello's got many laughs. Yeah, yeah, it? so it's a, it's a big comedy. Uh, so he was milking comedy. it for the... Yeah. 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 Got it. Well, this is awful. I know, yes. How do you, how do you not want to top yourself? Um, half the evenings when you come back from the theatre oh well I mean I often do but I, I, I mean I'm used to it I'm used to sort of um, the sensation of, of surrendering my evening to um, you know to the greater good is there, is there not sorry I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and re-persuade persuade you that maybe there is going to be a backlash mm. is it not still the case that people that uh, fuddy duddies like Rattigan mm. are actually more popular than than modish ones like well yes that's Pinter. true you, yes uh, certainly in Amdram I mean there's a huge uh, uh, gap between the sort of Amdram plays you get um, and where people are just doing it for the sheer love of it where Rattigan and Coward are very popular and Pinter uh, is not popular at all uh, still less UNESCO or Beckett you don't see them being played in the village hall um, by a, a group of uh, amateur players who are just doing it for the love of it you just don't see that do you like Pinter? Um, I, I, I like some of it. I like his funny stuff. When he's being funny, he's, he's um, excellent. Um, and I've just been to see uh, the latest in the Pinter Festival. I mean, they're trying to create a kind of religious aura about him now yeah. um, by playing his plays at a theatre uh, named after him. <clears throat> and uh, he, I, what I noticed, that he's, he's, very fu- he's a very funny sketch writer. But he can't end a sketch. He can't find a tag, as they call it. And that's the, the same problem is true of his his longer plays as well. He doesn't really know how to end them, and he'll he'll, he'll sort of wriggle out of it by giving a few of the characters sort of rather enigmatic speeches for about five minutes at the end. But he really can't wrap a play up properly, which is a shame. I, I must tell you my Harold Pinter story. Mm. Um, when I was younger, I was a diarist for various newspapers. And I used to have to go to first nights mm. often, and I went to some some. This was in the days before mobile telephones, and before, when you had to dictate your copy over the phone to a copy taker for the for, for the overnight ed- edition. And I can't remember what event it was, but anyway, I it was a black tie event, and I saw this chap, and I thought, well, he must be a chap in in, in in black tie. He must be. It was a posh hotel. He must be one of the people who works at the hotel. Uh, I said, excuse me, can you, can you tell me where the nearest phone is? And he looked at me and he said, I haven't a fucking clue where the nearest phone is. And I realised at that moment that it was the great man himself. Right. Oh so I've goodness. been told <coughs> almost to fuck off by Harold Pinter. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah I good bet you. you haven't. Have you? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I know. I'm afraid I've, <laughs> I walked past him, but I never met him. <laughs> <laughs> you never did. Yeah. Okay. You're listening to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special guest, Lloyd Evans. Right Park News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mensor. The real thing that the left is angry about is they're like, how could you allow these Russian memes? Somebody saw a meme and then they decided they had to vote for Trump. Or it must have been and fake news. And by fake news, they mean conservative websites. Come on. But this is what the left thinks. Fake news. And by fake news, what they mean is shut down Breitbart. Breitbart News Tonight. Weeknights, starting at 9 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here, once again, is James Delling Pole. Welcome back to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special guest, Lloyd Evans. Lloyd, fat. Yes. Tell me about fat. Fat. Well, there was a controversy in this summer which blew up uh, in the uh, critical uh, circle. Um, a critic called uh, Philip Fisher mentioned that a, a character played by an actress called Nicola Coughlin was fat. This is in a production at the Don Mar warehouse. And uh, Nicola Coughlin got very angry about this and complained and demanded an apology and demanded that the words be removed from the um, website of British Theatre Guide. And she said that the critic must not review my body, he must review my performance. 
Um, and the critic um, got very, uh, he, he delivered the apology, but then there was a kind of a Twitter storm and he got issued with death threats and he began to find it difficult to sleep. He began to lose weight, uh, paradoxically. And um, it, it was a really unpleasant um, business Horrible. for him. Horrible. And um, he, he thought that she had misrepresented his words in order to grab publicity. And so he, they both felt very aggrieved by it all. Uh, she felt that the apology was insincere and he felt that she had been uh, manipulating him. Um, but I, I mean, I think that she had really surrendered when she accepted that fat is an insult. Why is fat an insult? It is normal to enjoy eating. Uh, it's, it's healthy and natural to prefer uh, eating to taking exercise. I mean, if anything's unnatural, it's jogging, isn't it? Um, and so doesn't, I, doesn't Shakespeare have something to say about that? Let me have men about me that are, f- that are fat, fat and such as sleep at nights. Yes, that's yeah. right. He does, yes. Jon Kaska has a, a lean and hungry look. Yeah. Um, so so, so back in the day, yes, it was fatness good. was a desirable attribute. Absolutely, it has been. For, really, is, we're, we're living in very abnormal times where people go jogging and you look at their faces and see how much they're enjoying it. Um, and... You know, even I mean, the, the state bullies us into 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 losing weight, and doctors bully us and put us on drugs and tell us we've got diabetes. It's a completely invent, invented malady, type two diabetes, is anyway. Um, and even in schools, teachers weigh the children. It must be humiliating for these kids to be lined up because everyone can see as the kids are standing in line who's a little bit tubby, and then they send a, a letter home to the parents saying, you know, um, you know, fatso is causing earth tremors. You know, put him on a diet. <laughs> This is bullying. It's really, really unpleasant. And also, I mean, there's this myth that it's costing the NHS a fortune, as if somehow people people are kind of eating themselves to death. Well, I mean, that's that's simply not happening. No. A, it's a sign of, of a, an abundant society that that's, that's that's thriving. And B, it's actually not true anyway. The the, the obesity a- epidemic is way overdone. Yeah, uh, it's uh, overstated. Chris, Chris Snowden's very very good on this. And and C, of course, it's people. If they took more exercise, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have this problem. It's not. It's not because. It's not because evil companies are forcing sugar on on innocent victims, and they should be banned. No, no. It's just. It's freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. Yes, absolutely. By the way, was the was the actress fat? Uh, she's a little plump, um, but she's very attractive, and I think she was. So I you mean, would. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I mean. Oh well, there you are. You know, yes. He should have said she's fat. But, brackets, I would. Yeah, yes. Uh, I still would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, a lot of actors get involved in causes. Uh, Patrick Stewart is always getting involved in a cause. Uh, it's because they fear uh, obscurity. They fear being forgotten. And they want their faces to be on, on telly because you never know when the producer or the casting director is going to be watching. And so when actors um, support causes, don't forget, it's the, actually it's the, um, the, the cause is supporting the actor, not the other way around. That's interesting because what's his name from... Uh, from the wire, what's the what's the actor called? Uh, yes, Dominic West. Yes, gave a, a very interesting interview to the Spectator, in which the the journalist challenged him on his championing of these tiresome courses. I can't, he said, "Why why can't you just get on a, on with acting? Why why are you alienating half your audience? Because do you realise that there are some some people out there who don't believe in this in this political stuff?" And you are you are you are making life difficult for us to have to endure you as an actor. When all we can think about is why is he talking about this stupid rubbish when he's off stage? Uh, that's and, true. Yes. And he conceded that point. Yeah. He actually said, he "Well, maybe I should." Yeah, it was a very good piece. It was Melissa Kite. Melissa Kite. Yes. It was a mm. very good, yeah. good interview. Yeah, and, and she's absolutely right. She said, "Look, um, an actor is there to provide us with escapism." We don't want to know what you know which which worthy cause you happen to support, and, and actually, a lot of actors are. Uh, well, some actors are more careful about. Frankly, about I didn't really need to know that that that, um, that Gandalf is gay. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather not know about about Gandalf. Yes, sex, I know it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't doesn't greatly matter. No, um, I, I think he was. I mean, he first came out. Uh, it was quite it was quite a big event. I think. I mean, this were this would have been uh, more than twenty years ago. I think when John Major was in office and uh, he was welcomed into Downing Street, and that was regarded as a as a big moment for some reason. Yeah. I mean, you've got to remember that things were very different twenty years ago. I don't want to ruin the usual spec- suspects for you, but Kevin Spacey. He's, yeah, I know. He's, he's not. He's I, not. So great. I hear. So I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah yes, you you yeah, heard. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. No, let's not. Let's not. You know, we don't want <coughs> that rumor to be spread too, too no, far away. No, no, no. Imagine, imagine it would be like Rock Hudson's career being yeah, killed. Yeah, I know. When, yeah, when yeah. he. Yeah. Um, what were we, what were we talking about before I 
got distracted by that. Oh, that. we're talking about um, uh, people being fat and oh, yeah, critics yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and so on. Do you, do you find, I know what the answer is going to be, but do you, do you find, as I do, that I feel like a like I've landed on an alien planet, that the, this world is not what I recognise from... All the values seem to have disappeared. Yes, that's true. So things things have changed, and you don't know which. You, when you you know when you look back, you don't know what things were going to change and what which things weren't. No, we thought we thought when we were at university, we all imagined that the world was pretty much going to resemble the world that we knew then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think I think in terms of democracy, it's very interesting because when we were teenagers, democracy was uh, tentative and fragile. There were only a handful of democracies in in the world. Um, you know, there was Western Europe, uh, North America, India, uh, Australasia and Japan. But, you know, most of Asia, the whole of Africa, Central America, were basket cases, third world um, despotic states. And, and so for us, um, democracy is a privilege and it needs to be guarded. Whereas if you're young now, you probably think democracy is normal and is strong and is therefore, therefore you can chip away no, with, you with impunity. You, you also think, if you're young, you think democracy is a huge mistake and what you need is a, is a socialistic dictatorship. Yeah, Of, of true, the yes. proletariat, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, like that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the worst thing, and I think you agree on this with me on this one, is this, this transgender. Yes, I know. I, 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 this is very new, actually, and uh, it's extraordinary that uh, one group uh, is claiming rights at the expense of another vulnerable group, um, which is very unusual in the hi history of uh, political protest. But I have a solution for it. Um, first of all, it's obvious that this is a, a male problem. It's an all-male problem. You know, trans women are men. Uh, they have, in your, bo in your male body, you will have about 35 billion cells, each of which is male. And each of those cells will produce nothing but male cells for as long as you live. Um, now, some um, very butch men don't like effeminate women, uh, effeminate men, and so these these trans women are being attacked by men, not by women. So the solution really is for men to provide security guards in men's changing rooms, and there should be two security guards in every man's loo, every man's changing room. One will wear uh, ordinary men's clothes, another will wear a dress, and they are to uh, impose a strict rule of no transgender bullying and they aren't allowed to bully each other either and I think men should men should pay for this uh, in order to protect women from trans women because trans women are men and we shouldn't ask women to chaperone men right that sounds that sounds a very complicated solution to, I I can't help thinking again on the grounds that there's got to be a backlash in the theater maybe I'm just terminally naive but that this nonsense has has almost reached peak stupid and there must be a retreat at some stage i was thinking about this actually i, I, I can't remember whether it was because i was thinking about this because um i knew i was going to be interviewing you tomorrow uh the next day and and you're a playwright and s stuff like that but i was thinking it would make make quite a good play or a short story or something where by it's on an alien planet where um actually maybe i was maybe i was I can't remember my plot now. Right. It, it does. It do, it does seem weird that we're supposedly really advanced, and we look back on previous generations, of previous previous ages as ages of, of of credulousness and 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 weird superstitions and, and and all manner of nonsense, and that now we've evolved into these kind of super beings who, who we're, we're we're civilized in every every way, and yet. Um, isn't it bizarre that the people who who are at the top of the of the cultural feeding chain are men who've decided not to be men anymore, and that the the, the, the uber supreme culturally dominant figures are the men who've gone all the way and chopped off their bits, mm. chopped off the very symbol of the of the of, of the the power that that has uh, that has dominated society since forever. Uh -huh. Yes. I mean, isn't isn't that weird that we've rejected how many thousands, tens of thousands of years of of, of human presence on the planet, mm -hmm. and just now we're in that tiny fraction of history where the men without their woolies and their bulls are are the kind of these hermaphrodite emperor kings yes. of, of our world. Activists. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How weird is that? Well, it's very, very strange. And I mean, I've noticed that um, 
across the whole spectrum of activism, there is a kind of envy of the 20th century, especially the two great moments of activism in the 20th century. Um, the, the, the Weimar Republic and the, and the Black Panther movement, the, the Black Power movement in the, in the States. And um, that's why uh, every victim now wants to be a survivor, as if they've got through the Holocaust, they've got through Hiroshima. And um, people, um, uh, the trans activists are very envious of the, of the Black Power movement. Um, what, why is that? Why is that? Because they, they see it as a justification for um, civil disobedience and for taking to the streets and for silencing their, uh, violently silencing their opponents and um, calling them Nazis and things like that. And um, th that's, why they, that's why they want to um, create this myth of uh, an epidemic of suicide. They say that over 40% of trans women have attempted suicide. Right. Um, if you then say to them, well, actually, attempting suicide is a symptom of mental illness, do you think you're actually suffering from a mental illness? They go, they go completely nuts. But you can't reconcile... Um, well, they do, because they're, they're mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> by, but, I mean, virtually by, by, their, own, by their own admission. But if you, say, if, you, if you point out that there's a contradiction or that you can't reconcile that statistic with that, with that um, diagnosis, then they say that you're a, you're a Nazi and you're trying to kill them or something. I had to do a TV programme once on the BBC with one of the, the more prominent trans activists. And I thought, this person is a very attractive... Um, you know, it appealed to my kind of homosexual side. I thought, mm. that, you know, this is a very pretty boy yeah. that I'd probably have sex with in a gay moment, and, and, and he's wearing a dress. Was this on Newsnight? When yeah, you, yeah, that's and, right. And they, you actually started flirting with the... Yes. Yes. Well, he, he's a very good-looking woman, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. He's good-looking, whatever he mm. is. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. I, I, I don't mind people experimenting with their gender identity in a kind of weimar -y Mm. kind of way mm -hmm. it's it's slightly sort of pervy and, and weird and and you know sort of interesting but it's when they start telling us what kind of toilets we can use mm. and, and 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 the kind of people that our daughters have to share changing rooms yes, with it that's I when i start worrying about mm. it yeah yeah and also the type of pronouns we can use yeah it's it's fascistic, isn't yeah, it? It is, yeah. They want to police our thoughts and police the way we express ourselves. And, uh, I mean, the, this business of self-ID, the idea that any man uh, can say, well, I identify as a woman, so I, have, I claim a right to, um, <clears throat> to, to a changing room. Um, obviously, this, this threatens women because um, if it doesn't, you're assuming that, that men who are violent towards women are also the soul of honour and would never uh, perpetrate a falsehood in order to gain access to their victims. But, of course, they would. Yes, um, and we're, we're getting close to a situation with self-ID where you could have a, a, woman's, a women's rape crisis hostel with two women on the desk and three women uh, taking refuge in, the, in the, the bedrooms and then six beery lads can turn up and say, we're women, we yeah. demand, demand a room for the night and legally those women will be unable to, uh, to reject them. You know? That is where it's going. Although I wonder, that, that's right, the insight I had last night was, in a way, I think that... The, the transgenderism thing is was secretly caused by third wave feminism that feminism in its most aggressive modern form became this this culturally dominant form that to which ever, everyone else had to surrender and the only option men had to reclaim their power was by redesignating themselves women mm -hmm. <coughs> in order to create this special group that Yes, that's right, and that's that's the claim that the third wave feminists make. They say they're being they're being colonised. Their movement is being colonised, and their their spaces are being colonised. So they, they they regard it as a as a repeat of imperialism. Really. Yeah, that's one thing I never thought would happen in my lifetime mm. that I would find myself an ally mm. of of the green and common type feminists. Green and yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought that that Jermaine Greer mm. would become a semi Ally. Yes, yes, I know. I mean, she, she was, she's in, she said it 20 years ago. She said, these are not, uh, these are not women, these are mutilated men. But, or, or Camille Pallier, mm. who I, I so want to get on the podcast. Yeah, yeah she'd be great. She'd be great, yes. She'd be yes. mighty. Yes. I mean, even better than you, Lloyd. That's how good she'd, she'd yeah. be. Have you, have you had Jermaine on? No, I haven't. No, no. Uh, you'd probably like, I met her once. She's unbelievably argumentative. I mean, I love argumentative women, but I mean, she absolutely took the biscuit. Um, yes. She's, she reminds me in that respect of, of my trickiest podcast ge mm -hmm. guest, Peter Hitchens. Oh, right. Who I'm very fond of, but, but he'll, 
if you say something to him on which he agrees totally, he'll disagree with you just because he's Peter Hitchens and he feels it's his job to disagree with you on, a, on a, anything. Mm-hmm. And some, he's, got this, he's got this collection of fanboys, the, the people who, who like you know, Hitch, the Hitch Mark II. Mm-hmm. They, they, they really love everything he does. Yeah. And they saw this as the, the podcast that we did together as a kind of Hitch one. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he put you in your place. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Hitch was very, very, was needlessly difficult. And all I wanted to do was get the best out of him and get on. And that's, that's the whole point of these podcasts. Mm-hmm. I'm not in the business <clears> of kind of, of trying to catch people out yeah. and make them sound bad. It's a conversation between yeah. civilized people. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe he's not capable of that. Well, he's, I, I'm going to have him back on because he's interesting. Right. But it's a, it's a different, different experience. What, before we go and have an Italian lunch... Mm. Obviously, no meat in my case because I'm a vegan. No meat. Lol. Plenty of wine, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I can't. Oh, even, no, I'm, you're, I'm not you're even allowed not to drinking. drink wine. You're not allowed to. Who, well, who, who is it who's not allowing you? When I went to Germany to have my stem oh, cell yeah. therapy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I got my diet I was put in the care of their resident dietitian who is right. a bloody vegan. So she's a bit biased. Right. And she said, You must go on a vegan diet um, and you must not have any sugar, any alcohol any canned foods rubbish German accent um, any this sounds like quite an erotic encounter any, no I, I know this was by email I did oh by email oh, I, I, I did right. have erotic oh, counsel, I, I, semi-erotic counts with I, the German nurses right I, I would, yes. there is no one I would rather have put mm-hmm. a cannula in my vein yeah than a German did they have blonde plaits no the, None of them did actually. No, that, that that would have been too much. That would have been too much. Yeah. And and dirndl skirts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, they yeah. didn't. They didn't do. They didn't go right. that far. But they were they were pretty German and pretty nursy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it was pretty good. Um, and yeah. So apparently, my stem cells that I've been given to help cure my Lyme disease. Yes. They like an alkaline anti um, oxidant. Is that right? Yeah. Environment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so supposedly meat and animal fats generally have acid in them. Mm. So they're trying to keep my body alkaline so that my stem cells will kind of magically cure me and make me a kind of ubermensch, which is what I'm, you know, on the way to becoming. Yes, of course. These, thanks to these stem cells. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And right. it's good. Um, <coughs> have, we <coughs> have we put the world to rights? I think we have, yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we... Well, before this we evening, I'm, I, in my other, my other um, uh, career, I'm a playwright, and I'm trying to um, get some money, get some backing for a play to take to Edinburgh next uh, year. Yeah. Uh, it's a monologue spoken by Cherie Blair. Oh, I, yes. I, want to, I want to corner the market in the Cherie brand, which hasn't been seen on stage yet. So you're going to get sort of a, a gobby scouser with a huge mouth. Well, I've got an actress uh, who, who's from Cumbria, actually, and she looks very like Cherie did about 15 years ago, and right. she's perfect. And uh, so we're all set to go. And I'm going to go to this Balliol reunion called the Balliol Entrepreneurs. And you can meet people there who have literally made hundreds of millions of pounds in their in the sort of 30 years since uh, since we were there. Uh, so for them, a, a small investment of 10,000 will be uh, lose change. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, yeah. well, well good luck. So, so tell me a bit, bit about this more. It sounds good. Oh, the mo- yeah, about uh, Sheree. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, um, the thing is that she's the most talented and remarkable prime ministerial consort there has ever been. Uh, I mean, if you compare her with, say, Norma Major or yeah. Mary Wilson, you know, these are not uh, singular people. But she came from... Mary Wilson was a, was she a, was a, was a poet. poet. She was a poet, yes. She, was a, you know, she wrote nice decorative poems. Right, OK. Um, Sheree came from an obscure convent in, on, in the outskirts of Liverpool to the centre of politics in Downing Street. Uh, she was unbelievably ambitious and clever and um, very political. She was a member of the Labour Party from the age of 16. Tony Blair didn't join the Labour Party until he was about 22. Um, and she was much more political than he was. She was the Lady Macbeth of uh, She was, Blair. yes. Well, that was, the, that, that, that was the way people would attack him, by attacking her. And that really hasn't stopped. She's still immensely unpopular. Yeah, but, but deservedly so. I'm sorry. She, she was responsible, I'd say, even more than the evil Blair for turning Britain into a lawyer ocracy mm-hmm. and, and particularly the rise and rise of human rights law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, which didn't at, exist. At, at the taxpayer's yeah. expense. Yeah. Matrix Chambers. No, I'm, I'm not... You, you're being too gallant there. Mm-hmm. I, I think she's, she's a, she was a pain. Right, OK. Um, what would be the... Who was the most evil Roman woman? Uh, um, the most evil Roman woman? Um, yeah. Well, uh, according to my Claudius, it was, um, it was uh, Augustus's wife. She Livia? 
Okay, so she's Livia then. Yeah. She's Livia Soprano, Livia, Livia yeah. Claudius. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. This is this is this is the way she was perceived. Yeah, Lady Macbeth. Okay. Uh, and, and the first person to call her Lady Macbeth, sorry, was um, none other than John Burko. Uh, a rather sexist comment, which I'm sure he would now uh, try to disclaim. Yeah, I bet he would. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So. You, is this is your monologue a rehabilitation? It is, you know, oh, because you, I want you. But, you know, I want to. I, of course, I want to get people who who simply want to find that the the um, the unpleasant side of yeah. Sheree. But there's a lo- there's a lot to her, uh, and there's a lot of there are, there are a lot of myths uh, that need to be corrected. I think, um, and there's an interesting gossip. You know, Alistair Campbell, uh, Tony Blair's right hand man, was once a um, a pornographer who used the um, nom de plume um, Riviera Gigolo. Uh, so there are interesting Did little, little facts. Yes, what, yes. What, for, he wrote for Penthouse uh, when he was in his early 20s, I think. Right. Mm. Would I imagine journalism paid? Uh, it probably did, yes, yes. Yeah. In, in those days. Have you, have, yeah. you, have you read any of his porn? Um, it's not top of mind reading list, but uh, maybe next summer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that's a good way to end. Uh, Alistair mm. Campbell, pornographer. Yeah. Um, you're listening to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special, wonderful guest, theatre critic. Uh, playwright, Welshman Lloyd Evans. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, James. Okay, bye. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Everything in hip hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please. Don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.